Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, Episode 9. I'm Steve Kwan. I am Matt Kwan. Welcome. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent BJJ approach. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about learning. So last time, we talked about techniques for learning rapidly. That's all great, but how do you remember what you've learned? <laughs> this is something that I think we've all struggled with to some extent, especially people who are, you know, new at jujitsu or they're exploring a new idea. You know, when you're getting a lot of things thrown at you all at once, it's very hard to have those things stick. Um, you know, I, I think we've all had this feeling where you go to class and you, you know, you get exposed to a few things and you drill them in class and you feel pretty good about them. And as soon as you leave class and get in your car, you've already forgotten them and you never apply them again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's so much to learn in jiu-jitsu. It really is a life art and uh, you can't learn it all in one day and in one session. So hopefully today we can talk about a few tools that you can use that will help you retain the knowledge you learn in class. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of ties into a, a series of episodes that we want to do on learning. Um, hopefully you find this helpful. Something to remember though, and this is something that my instructor actually just told me a week or two ago, you know, don't feel guilty if you can't remember everything. To some extent that is natural, you know, but at, at the end of the day though, having tools in your toolbox to help you recall this stuff is definitely going to help. Uh, and not just recall this stuff too, but you also need to be able to recall this stuff extremely quickly. When you're grappling, you can't afford to have to kind of wait for your, your memory banks to pull the idea out. Uh, you know, this is, is something I think Salo Hibero said where it's like, if you, if you have to think, you're, you die, basically. You can't afford to, to think. You need to be able to, you need to have things retained and be able to recall them so quickly that it just kind of happens fluidly on the mat. High level, gra high level grapplers probably can all relate, you know, and when you're, when you're sparring after you have a lot of experience, you're not really thinking on the mats. Like you're not thinking, oh, where do I put my hand? Oh, what's, what's the next step from here? Things just kind of happen because you've ingrained them so deep into your muscle memory that you don't have to think. And that's a big part of where you want to get to in jujitsu. And that's kind of what we want to cover today. What are the tools that you can use to get there? Yeah. And not only do you want to be able to move fluently and, and have these thoughts come to you in real time but uh, they need to come before your opponent has these, mm -hmm. you know, the proper defenses. So we want to get ahead of their opponent's defense and get into a position where um, not only are we in sync with our opponent, but we actually get ahead of them in terms of how we're sequentially attacking them. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. So I guess we can start this conversation off by talking about some tips and tricks that you can use just at a, at a very basic level to help you remember things. Um, I, I can say what I, what I do personally. Now, this might be excessive. I'm not entirely sure. But what I do is after every training session, I take notes on what I covered. Um, I don't take notes during the class. I, I personally find that to be incredibly distracting and it's hard to pay attention to what's going yeah. on. Um, also, my, my goal is not to get notes on paper. My goal is to improve my ability to recall. So if I'm sitting there taking notes during class, that doesn't improve my ability to recall anything, right? I, those notes might just go on a shelf somewhere afterwards and I never look at them again. So what I do is I wait a bit, um, either a few hours after class or even a, the next day. Then I sit down and I just write a very quick bullet point lists of what it is that we covered in that last class. Uh, if it's something that we've already done before, which is often the case. Like if, you know, we're doing like an, a variation of a knee cut and it's something I've done before 20 times and I already know all of the steps quite well and I already know all of the details quite well. I only write down the things that are new. So if I learned like one new detail, I'll, I'll write down that one new detail and, and disregard everything else. And that helps me prevent these things turning into a gigantic essay, right? Because you don't want to be spending more time taking notes than you are training. Uh, that That's one thing that I, I do. And the, the question though is, well, how do you even remember what to write about if you're writing a day later? What I do is while I'm in class as kind of like a mental mnemonic, I basically just remember the number of techniques that we did. So if my, let's say that I'm, I'm in class and we're doing knee cut passing, which is something we've been working on recently. Let's say that we cover three different variations of a knee cut. All I remember is in my head is the number three. I don't remember the specific variations. I just remember, hey, there's three things I've got to write down. I can remember one number. That's easy. Then 
when I go to take my notes afterwards, the only thing I remember is that one number. And then I have to sit there for like a good five or 10 minutes and pull out of my memory bank exactly what it was that we did. And it takes some time, but that active recall is what strengthens your long-term memory. So by doing that, by, by sitting down and saying, okay, I got three things. What were they? Oh yeah, knee cut pass if the guy hip escapes. Oh yeah, or knee cut pass if the guy turtles. Like, what do you do here? And then I, again, I write down only the things that are new observations to me or things that I, I haven't learned before. Um, what I do then, and, and this is the part where I, I actually find this to be incredibly helpful, is I use a technique called spaced repetition. Uh, this is something that I discovered quite recently, but basically it's a learning mental model uh, and it's psychologically proven to dramatically increase your ability to recall things over the long term. So basically how spaced repetition works, if you want to know details about this, by the way, just Google spaced repetition, like you'll, you'll find tons of stuff on this. The idea is basically you write down like on flashcards, for example, all of the things that you want to remember. So maybe let's say Matt shows me an awesome new detail on how to retain 411, right? I just write down that one detail. Um, and then what I do is I file that away. Now the way, and so I do that with everything. So you wind up with like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, these notes. And the idea with spaced repetition is I then once a day, I sit down and I look at my notes and I try to recall these things. So I'll get like a flashcard and it'll say like, what was the cool new wedge technique that Matt showed about the 411? And I'll sit there and I'll try to recall it. If I succeed at recalling it and I remember it properly, then I reduce the frequency with which I have to review this. If I fail, then I increase the frequency. So let's say for example, that this technique, I remember it successfully. Maybe then I'll check it again the next day. And if I remember it successfully again, then maybe I'll check it a week later. And I, if I remember it successfully again, then I'll check a month later and then eventually a year. And it gets to the point where, you know, once you've recalled something, you basically won't see this thing again for like two more years in, in your list. If I fail to recall something, then I have to check it more frequently. So let's say this thing is, I'm supposed to check this once a month and then I, I can't remember what it is. Then I would drop the recall back down to like once a week until I remember it again. And this technique dramatically increases your ability to recall things. Now, this probably sounds like a total nightmare to actually set this up. Um, the good news is there's like a lot of apps and stuff that will do this for you. So I, I've got this app on my phone, I, on my iPhone called Smart Cards. And basically it's like after class, I just go and I like create a flashcard and I, I just type in my notes and then I save it. And then it reminds me automatically when I need to recall this note or when I need to review it. So once a day I sit down and it says like, hey, you've got 10 things you need to review. So I go through them and I either say, yes, I was able to recall this or no, I wasn't. And then it automatically kind of sets it up, this up for you. It, it's actually a really quick process. It takes like five, 10 minutes a day, but it has dramatically increased my ability to recall things. Like I can, I can pitch perfect, remember things from like seminars from like eight months ago because of this. Like Matt, you remember like that seminar before you got your black belt with Rob? Like I can remember every single thing, every single thing he showed right down to fine details because of this technique. Mm -hmm. So it might, it might be overkill, but it is a tremendously effective way to remember stuff if you're really struggling with this. Yeah. For myself, I, I find that lists are a really good way to prioritize things that need to be done first uh, in everyday life. Um, I have tried writing notes when it comes time to learn uh, new techniques and things like that, but I do find it difficult to go back to the notes and also like you mentioned, if you're trying to learn something in class in real time, writing notes can be quite detrimental because yeah. you want to absorb as much as you can with your with your mind and, and, and really trying to understand things as they come. So I'm not so much of a, me uh, of a notes guy, I mean luckily, uh, it is 2019 and we all have cameras on our phones. Yeah. So if possible, I do like to try and film things or try and get footage of what I'm trying to learn. And from there, it's easier for me to visualize these things when I can see them. I'm, I'm a very visual learner and uh, that was always the way that I... Uh, I practice good cooking techniques was by mimicking what I saw and trying to uh, replicate techniques that I saw. Um, again, it's not the best idea to have a camera in front of you while you're trying to learn because you are, uh, you know, you're, you're, you do have divided attention trying to get good footage and try to learn at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, um, but having footage is something that really helps me learn as opposed to words, even though I will say like, 
Uh, I do have a number of jujitsu books and uh, a few of them in particular. I really like the Marcelo Garcia Butterfly Guard book. That book is amazing. I, I found that uh, when I do read things in books and uh, read the text, and that book happens to be very visual as well. It has a lot of good pictures. Uh, your, your brain does absorb the information in a different way than as if, mm-hmm. as if you were just watching video. So uh, I, I just recommend that you try and sort of see like your learning style, what what works best for you. We're all different. Some people like to write things down. Some people like to uh, listen audibly to things. Some people need to read things. and uh, A lot of people need to do them. A lot of people need to do them. Like uh, for me to, to really, uh, to be able to know what a technique is, I need to feel it and I need to do it. Um, and, uh, also I'm, I'm quite a visual learner, so it's yeah. important to identify what is your learning style. Yeah. And for a lot of people, the answer is going to be a combination, right? For myself, um, I'm a combination of like, I, I need to absorb things and I really need to think them through. And I find writing it down really helps. At the end of the day, though, I do need to actually do the thing myself to some degree. So I'm kind of like a combination of those, those approaches. And it, it Actually, one of the reasons we started this podcast is because we felt that this was a learning style that was being kind of unserved, right? There are like jujitsu picture books that kind of go through instructionals and there's a lot of tutorial videos, but this kind of like cerebral philosophical audio medium is something that people generally don't do. There are jujitsu podcasts out there, but they're mostly like interviews, right? You know, and, mm-hmm. and that what we wanted to do was to have a place where we could talk about big ideas behind jujitsu in a medium that is suited for that kind of discussion. So we're trying to serve a type of learning style here that we don't feel is really being effectively served right now. And yeah, to, to your point, I mean, Writing notes and lists is not going to be for everybody. For for me, this spaced repetition technique has been super helpful and taking notes and, and then recalling them later. It's not as brutal as it sounds. It actually t- only takes a few minutes to write the notes and then a few minutes every day to recall them. I would highly suggest everybody give it a try. Um, but worst case scenario, if you don't want to do that and you just want a quick way to try to remember what you did yesterday in class, um, my, su- my suggestion would be to use um, mnemonics or memory cues. So what I mean by that is kind of an example is what I gave earlier, where like if, if you go to a seminar and you're, you learn, there are eight different techniques that are covered. And unfortunately, this is a big problem in a lot of seminars where it's just like a technique bombardment. Um, we've already talked extensively about how you probably want to prefer principles over techniques, but the reality is a lot of other people don't think that way and they're going to throw these techniques at you and it's good to at least have some mind space in your head to absorb that information. What I do again is I just count the techniques. So rather than trying to remember every detail, I pay attention during the, during the class or the seminar. I don't sit there taking notes. I give my full undivided attention to the technique and I just mentally count. So when a professor shows one technique, I think to myself, one. And then when they show the second technique, I think two. And when they show the third, I think three, then four, then five. And at the end of the class, I come away with one number. And then the next day I sit down and I can remember one number pretty easily. And then I spend just five or 10 minutes walking through in my head everything we did. And just doing that one time, Um, after, you know, after a day or so of, of rest, it tests your brain's ability to recall that or after a a length of time. And that increases like, you know, basically it strengthens the mental synapses between that idea and your short, bringing it back into your short term. Yeah. It's a, it's a mental exercise that's testing your mind, your memory. Yeah. yeah. And I, I can, I will eventually remember all of those things because if I remember, Hey, there were eight techniques that we did, but I can only recall five of them. I'll sit down there for another few minutes and I'll kind of mentally retrace my steps. And eventually I'll I'll remember those techniques, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing you can do is you can come up with like mnemonics or trips to, or tricks for memory. Um, You know, this is kind of like a common thing. If you can come up with acronyms or abbreviations that are easier to remember, it can make it easier, easier to remember big complex concepts. Like in school, you were probably taught bed mass, right? (laughs) Even if you haven't done uh, high school math for 20 years, you probably remember what bed mass is and what it stands for. And that goes to show the importance of um, like mnemonics in, in jujitsu and in long-term memory recall. Which is essentially just establishing like an order of operations, which everything in jujitsu basically does have an order of operations. Uh, like we've talked about in previous episodes is you wouldn't want to do an arm bar on someone who has full alignment, uh, you know, break their alignment, isolate the arm, break their posture, all that stuff. Then you can go for your technique. 
Yeah, yeah. And we talked in an earlier episode about the importance of naming concepts to make them easier to remember. That also makes them easier to recall. And that is in itself actually a memory cue, right? I mean, an example I can give, I remember I I did a seminar a long, long time ago and what... The, there was like a choke that was shown and the one of the guys that I was training with, um, he just started calling it the knife choke. And his thought was like, well, the, the thing you're doing with the blade of your hand is kind of like a knife. Like it's a silly little thing, but it's a powerful memory cue because now all you have to think about is one thing that kind of ties back to what you were learning and then you can kind of rebuild the story in your head. You just need like, it's like, you know, what back in the day they used to tie a string on your finger to tell you, hey, there's one thing you got to remember. You're not going to necessarily write down exactly what that thing was, but just the act of like having a bridge between your short term and your long term memory makes it easier to bring things back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I I like how you uh, talk about like taking an object like a knife and uh, and associating that with a technique. Yeah, That, that is a smart mental tool because it will always remind you of that the name of that move. Yeah. Like I've been working this weird new like shoulder wedge choke that I've I've never really seen anyone do before. It doesn't have a name as far as I know. I've just been calling it the crocodile choke because like you have to move your body kind of like you're like a crocodile. And that helps me recall that stuff. Another thing we talked about in an earlier episode is if someone teaches something to you, sometimes just naming that mentally naming that technique after that person makes it easier uh, Mm -hmm. to recall. Like if Matt shows me a really effective foot lock or something I've never seen before, in my mind, instead of calling it like the reverse the mat lock, <laughs> you know, mat lock. <laughs> well, maybe I would, but instead of calling it like the you know like the reverse inside ashy double spinning inverted heel hook, I might call it the, the mat lock. Right? I mean, a common example is uh, some of you guys out there who have watched uh, the UFC. If I ask you what is the like the uh, the Phil Davis lock or what is the Wonder Lock, you probably you might know what I'm talking about, the Mr. Ba- Wonderful. The mis- yeah, it's basically the the, Phil, the Mr. Wonderful, the Phil Davis behind the back like kind of one and a half arm Kimura he did a few years ago. Or I've heard people talk about the Mir lock, which is the, the Frank Mir arm lock he did on Pete Williams like 15 years ago. Yeah, Darce choke. Yeah, yeah. Like the, this kind of, there's a reason why you hear about th- ch- things like the Darce choke where things are named after people. It's because that is a very powerful way to recall something, especially if you have a personal connection to it, right? Like if I talk about like the Darce choke, well, I don't know Darce. I don't even know who that is. <laughs> so I don't have a personal connection. But if Matt shows me a move or something I haven't seen before, and I call it like the Matt Quan guard, to me, that has massive meaning. And, and it's easier if I have an emotional connection to that move. Like if, if Matt did that to me and crushed me a hundred times and I give it a name, it's easier for me to recall that. And then I can kind of recall the pieces and I because I can replay that story in my mind. Mm-hmm. Got it. So another thing on the topic of um, how do you remember stuff? There's there's a few other little tricks that you can recall. One of them, uh, we talked about this briefly in an earlier episode, uh, technique visualization or meditative drilling or whatever you want to call it. Basically, the act of kind of taking to a, mo- a moment to yourself and walking through a technique in your mind can be very helpful. Like if you see something and it's so foreign to you that you know you can never pull it off because you have to think. I find that just like sitting down for five or ten minutes and closing my eyes and walking through the steps in my mind... And kind of like dreaming, daydreaming that I'm actually doing this move to someone helps a lot. Because the first time, it's just like training. The first time you do it, it's going to take you a while because you have to think about all the steps. But if you spend five or ten minutes doing it, by the end of the time, by the last time you actually try to recall it, you can probably recall all of the bits and pieces quite quickly. It's no substitute for actual live drilling, but it's something, right? And it can be very helpful if... Um, for whatever reason, you're just not able to get into this position regularly on the mat, right? Like sometimes there's a, a, posi- a particular position you might want to train and you're just having difficulty getting in there, but you still want to reinforce that position. Or, or maybe you just don't have the time to train for a while. This is a good way to sharpen up those techniques. Yeah, that, that that's something that really helped me, especially when I, I was still working a job is I, I would... Uh, I'd be doing my job basically just going through the motions when really the whole time I'm thinking about jujitsu. But <laughs> it's kind of life, isn't as, it? As, as as I'm here, but yeah. my mind is on the mat. As I'm sure a lot of these listeners can relate to. Um, but it really helps you. Uh, the more times that I replayed techniques in my mind, and for most of the time for me, it was it was judo because I really struggled with some throws and wrapping my head around what I'm trying to do with throws. Um, 
I was able to get repetitions in times when I couldn't train and I essentially was trying to make up for lost time that I couldn't train. So uh, not being able to go through the motions and do judo as much as I could, I was able to visualize these techniques and just wrap it out and think about what, you know, how should my body be moving? How should my feet be planted? How should my kazushi be set up? And then mm -hmm. you realize that you have these moments where you're like, oh yeah, like I sort of, I, I, I can grasp this a little bit more intimately mm -hmm. as opposed to if I just relied on my time on the mat doing physical ex, uh, exercise. And then another time, uh, not, not just not just at work, but usually uh, at, at night when I'm lying in bed, these are the times when I, uh, I visualize the techniques and I kind of run through the repetitions in my head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we keep plugging Josh Waitzkin's book, The Art of Learning, but because it is a great book. And it's also written by a jiu-jitsu black belt under Marcelo Garcia. So theoretically, he's got to know something. Uh, but one of the things he talks about in that book, he, he has a mental model called form to leave form. Um, and what he basically means by this big fancy kind of wishy-washy name is if you take something and you see it for the first time or you're unfamiliar with it, you've got to really think to work, you know, you have to use your conscious mind to recall what that is. It, it actively takes effort to pull that thing out of your memory banks and into your working memory. Um, it's kind of like how a computer, for those who are familiar with how computers work, you've got your hard drive and you've got your RAM and your RAM is really, really fast, but it's small. You can only hold so much in your RAM. And then you've got your hard drive, which is gigantic, but it's slow. It takes a long time to, to recall things and to pull them out of there. The human brain is like that, right? You've got your long-term memory, which can hold a lot, but it, it takes effort to pull stuff out. Yeah. And then you've got kind of your short-term memory, which is like, you know, ability to quickly recall stuff. So part of what Josh Waits can talks about here is he says that like, if you drill something enough, if you drill it over and over and over again, eventually you're basically able to pull it out of your conscious mind into your subconscious mind. Like if you, if you've done something so frequently that, that it like goes into your muscle memory, then you don't need to think about it anymore. And then you can focus on bigger ideas. And I, I think everyone in jujitsu has some experience with this, right? Like the first time you try to like, I don't know, like pull close guard, you actually have to kind of really think about it. Like what, where do my arms go? Where do my legs go? Oh, what if he moves this way? Like it's a very... So many variables. Yeah, it's a very intellectually demanding activity. And if you've got to think and pull each one of those things off of your hard drive, which is really slow, you're never going to succeed in jujitsu. So the reason why we train and why there is no substitute for time on the mat is because the more you do this, eventually it, it, it builds up like a habit, right? It, it moves into your subconscious mind to the point where you don't need active mental power to do this anymore. Your body just and your mind just know how to do it instinctively. So pulling things out of your, out of your brain and being able to operate on an instinctual level is kind of like the key to advancing it and learning anything physical. Mm -hmm. um, because once you get that, then that becomes a building block that then you can build on top of, right? Like if you've basically instinctualized how to pull close guard, well, now it's a lot easier to like throw up a triangle because you don't have to think about like, well, what, what does close guard mean? Where do my, how exactly do I play this position, right? So that, that's kind of a very important mental model when it comes to learning anything physical, that just repetition ceaseless repetition eventually pulls things into muscle memory and that's really the foundation of solid performance in martial arts yeah and and not just martial arts like you said pretty much in anything mm -hmm. uh a great example for me one of the most foundational skills uh, that i had in my previous career was knife skills so mm -hmm. you know if you're if you're a cook you realize that knife skills kind of drive the bus in terms of your production and if your knife skills are not good, not only are you more prone to injury, but you're not going to be able to produce as much. So well, the only way you can get good at knife skills is just practice, repetition. It's all practice, right? Uh, and and the key to doing that is is trying to avoid injury. Not, not only do you have to try and maximize production, but you've got to avoid your injury. So focusing on what technique is going to be the most efficient not necessarily how you can do something the fastest or the strongest and then repeat, uh, repeating that technique over and over and over is going to again program you physically and mentally to be able to carry out the task 
uh, in the quickest and safest way possible. Yeah, and this process of taking things out of your conscious effort requiring brain and making the muscle memory goes beyond just physical things too, right? It also is how you build effective habits. Like, I mean, as an example, how much mental ev- effort do any of us put into brushing our teeth in the morning? Really not much, right? I mean, it's there's actually a few steps there that you have to think about, but it just you just kind of do it, right? Because you've been doing it for so long. Similarly, I mean... All of you probably remember if you, if, you know, if you, assuming you have a driver's license, like, man, when you first start driving, it is a terrifying, confusing nightmare. But after you've been doing it for a while, it's like your brain just kind of goes on autopilot because you, you're so ingrained. You've done it so much that like your body just know in your mind, you just know how to do this without even having to think about it. Or even to take it one step further, driving standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you, do you drive, you ever learn how to drive? I, I don't drive stick. You no, never I drive automatic. I, I, I owned a, a Honda Civic that was a manual. I, I still really miss it to this day it was an awesome car to drive but driving standard is uh and for those of you out there that do drive standard you understand that mm-hmm. remember the first time you learned how to drive standard it was like learning how to drive all over again like there were times when i didn't even want to go out on the road anymore <laughs> yeah. because i was afraid that i was going to roll into someone or i was going to get stuck on a hill and i wouldn't be able to start the car again uh it's it's intimidating it's just like in jujitsu when you're learning that first skill there's a there's a time when your mind needs to program itself uh, and really digest what you're doing. And then, you know, hopefully in a, a few weeks or a month or even a few months for some people, I know it becomes a second nature thing. And then, you know, if, if you, again, going back into uh, a, a situation like I was describing when you're learning knife skills, normally when you'd be focusing on not cutting yourself and, you know, getting your production done. Now you're, you're using your knife subconsciously and you're able to have your mind focus on what your next step is going to be. Yeah. You're already planning your next sequence, uh, of tasks while your knife work is essentially just on autopilot. Yeah. And th- this is how you get good at jujitsu too, right? Once you've ingrained the core mechanics into your body, your body is doing the things that need to happen now while your mind is planning what you can do later. Uh, and that's, that's what allows you to be a long-term strategic thinker. And that's how you effectively execute strategy because if you can't do that if you have to be just in the moment right now and you you know it takes a ton of mental effort you can't set up a plan you can't implement a strategy you need to instinctualize all of those basic core mechanics so that's that's what form to leave form is as josh waiskin calls it so another thing that can be helpful is, you know, and we've talked about this a lot, principles over techniques. So rather than thinking of every, and trying to remember the details. Yeah, trying to of, recall them all. Yeah, of, of trying to recall every single move. Acknowledge that that's kind of a losing game. Focus on understanding the core principles of jiu-jitsu, particularly alignment. And from there, you can really quickly piece together anything that you need, right? You don't need to remember exactly all of the different ways that you can armbar someone from side control. You just need to remember alignment and then the particular situations will kind of like emerge and resolve themselves organically. Mm -hmm. Um, Another interesting thing that Matt brought up, which I I think is applicable, if you're having trouble, you know, recalling techniques, when you see something new um, and it's very kind of like detailed and, and, you know, it's maybe something completely exotic that you've never done before. Like, let's say you're getting exposed to like worm guard or something for the first time. Something that's helpful is to do uh, what a- actually Elon Musk pioneered, something called first principles thinking. So basically the idea is you take this big complicated idea and you break it down and, and relate it back to like the base principles that you understand, the foundational principles. And then from there, you rebuild the idea in your mind with that knowledge. So like as an example, let's say that we're talking about, I, I don't know, like a triangle from closed guard, right? I want a triangle mat. I've never seen this move before. I've got two approaches. One is I can try to recall all 20 steps that are required to do a triangle. That's not going to work for a few reasons. First of all, my memory is not good enough. Uh, second of all, that doesn't take into account the variation caused by my opponent moving around yeah. and trying different all the things. Factors. Yeah. So what I can do instead is I can say, well, okay, I see what this triangle thing is, but how does this apply to alignment? Alignment is my first principle. Like how, how do I turn this into a discussion about alignment and frames and levers and wedges? And I can think to myself, well, okay, like it seems like the core of this thing is I basically need to break my opponent's alignment before I do anything. I need to attack his posture. How can I do that? Well, there's a few ways. You know, if I use one of his arms as a lever, I can twist and off balance him and then maybe pull him down. You know, 
when I start to apply the actual triangle, I can imp I can break his his posture even further by turning 90 degrees to the side. Uh, and when I actually apply the choke, basically it's a series of wedges around the head, right? We talked about this earlier where a, a blood choke generally involves kind of creating a triangle around your opponent's head where you've got wedges on each carotid artery and then you have a wedge behind the neck that pushes the head down. Um, so if I think about it at that way, then I can kind of rebuild that and I can sort of figure out based on that, those first principles, what a triangle actually looks like in practice. And I, and I realized pretty quick, hey, look, it doesn't really matter where my hands are or where my arms are or whatever. All that matters is I'm breaking this guy's alignment down and then I'm using my legs to wedge against his neck and his arm. That's yep. all a triangle is. And you're just reverse engineering the technique into the already existing foundation of alignment yeah. and essentially just proofreading your work. And uh, I find that when I find something new, I always try and uh, I always try and relate it back to the alignment concepts. Where's the levers that I'm trying to activate? You know, where am I in alignment? Do I have base? Does my opponent have base? If they do, how can I take away their base, or how can I properly break their posture or structure that'll lead me into an advantageous position and deny them defense? Yeah, the uh, the thing we talked about earlier, the alignment scorecard game, is a really good way to quickly evaluate these situations. So, if you're you know you're trying something like this and you want to really figure out how like a triangle works, ask yourself. Do I have posture? Do I have structure? Do I have base? And assign yourself a score accordingly between zero to three. And then you do the same for your opponent, right? Does he have posture? Does he have structure? Does he have base? And if he has any of those, then your job is to figure out, well, how do I take that away? Yeah. And that's basically all jujitsu is. Yeah. And one, and then you can take it one step further. Once you, once you've now established that you know you can replicate a triangle and you can get to that position, now it's time to think about, okay, now that I can do this triangle, what is my opponent going to do to react? So I'm, he, what we're going to do is create a, a several predictable reactions from my opponent in his defense. So when my opponent stacks me, I'm going to create a nice strong frame with my spine. I'm going to get my hips up and sometimes I assist that frame with two hands outstanding uh, two hands extending onto my legs reinforcing my triangle um, you know if, if they try and uh, posture up I'm going to make sure that I pull their head down and I break their posture and I use my knees and hips as well to break their posture so they're having these uh, if they try and turn to the side, I'm going to either modify my triangle depending on what they do or I'm possibly switching to a different submission like an arm bar from the triangle. Knowing where my opponent is going to go and, and understanding that, hey, there's several, it could be four, five, six, seven predictable reactions from my opponent. This mindset of thinking ahead is going to keep you ahead of their defense and uh, you're going to be able to subconscious, eventually with enough practice and repetition, you're going to be able to subconsciously have answers from for those uh, defenses. Ideally, without even thinking about them, yeah, just yeah. as a second nature thing. Now, if you're a beginner, you know, you might have heard what Matt and I just riffed on here with the triangle and you might have thought, geez, that sounds really complicated. You guys just talked about like half a dozen different variations and all of these different steps. And but in, in reality, though, all we talked about was alignment. We just talked about a lot. We applied alignment and then we applied it again and then we applied it again. So it's really easy for us to recall just off the cuff how to apply a triangle and how to handle all of these variations without really having to think about it. We can just wing it like that because we really are only thinking about one thing and that is alignment, right? And if you can kind of get to the point where you're thinking about that and even better, if you can get to the point where, as we discussed earlier, you get these kinds of things into muscle memory, then suddenly you'll find a lot of these previously complex concepts just kind of happen automatically. Yeah, awesome. Cool. And because we're black belts. Of course, of course. There's a, there's a you know, when you have a black belt, yeah. the, the belts are actually enchanted. There's like a, they, they immediately increase your skill. When I take that belt off to like go in the shower, I, I suck. I'm just completely yeah. useless. And if you wash your belt, you're you're going to lose all, you lose like a rank. Oh God, let's not, okay. People, I know we talked about this earlier. Please wash your belts. Don't give people staff. <laughs> okay, so, so one other thing to probably talk about here. We've talked extensively about retaining knowledge, but a big part of that is understanding that you don't have to retain everything. You know, you're actually doing yourself a disservice if you try to clutter your brain with as much stuff as you can possibly put in there. Uh, once you get to a high level, it becomes less about adding more stuff into your, your head and more about taking things out. Um, you need to be able to make strategic decisions about where you should apply your focus because even those of us who train a lot 
only have so much time and, and so much energy, and we need to make sure that we're getting the most out of that. Um, I kind of think of this as like pruning techniques, where you know once you've got a lot of stuff in your in your head, you need to kind of make assessments about what's really going to work for you and where you should focus your attention. It it is totally fine to forget techniques if you've made like a conscious decision that that just isn't going to be part of your game. Yeah, and I think it's Bruce Lee who said it. I could be wrong, but you know, he said use whatever works, mm-hmm. discard what whatever doesn't, right? So so how do you know what's going to work and what doesn't work for you? The the fact of the matter is everyone's different. Everyone's got a different body type with different attributes, different skill sets, different ages, right? We're all, we're all different. So we're all going to have different moves that work for us and mm-hmm. moves that don't work for us. So, you know, I always just think what what works and what doesn't work. I always run it through the the alignment concept because because it has to be conceptually sound first of all. If it passes that test, you know, we think of it a, of it as a filter. If it passes the alignment concepts and it's technically sound, then I think, you know, okay, well d- does this require attributes? Does this require tremendous flexibility is it is is that something you know and and i also have to keep in mind for my own body you know i might have injuries and are these moves going to compromise these injuries and what can go wrong if if i do this move incorrectly and of course i always have to like we talked about i always have to maintain uh my alignment when i do this move i never want to try to incorporate a technique into my game if it intentionally uh, misaligns my body. So I know a lot of you 10th planet guys out there are going to hate me, but moves from bottom side control, for example, things like that. It's, it's, it, that's the type of stuff where I know it, some people use it and sometimes dramatically effectively, but I'm not going to enrich my game heavily with moves that are from bad positions. I might have a few Hail Marys that usually will help me get back to my guard, right? And, and they could work. If they don't work, I get back to my guard anyways, but I'm not necessarily going to be looking for, uh, for submissions from a bad position, right? Yeah, yeah. Because so, there isn't, like we talked about, like when we talk about bed mass and order of operations, it's important to know, well, let's say my guard is passed, I should be thinking about regarding. If someone's on my back, I'm not thinking about submitting them. God knows I've been burned doing that enough times to realize that this move really like an ankle lock from the back uh, when someone's on your back. This is not a, a conceptually or technically sound move because some people aren't going to tap to that. Most people aren't going to tap to that. And a lot of the time you're going to get yourself in trouble and just stuck in rear mount when you should be focusing on your escape. So, yeah. so it has to, it has to make conceptual sense. It has to make sense in terms of alignment and it has to make sense for your body as well. Mm-hmm. And I would also add that it has to make sense relative to what your goals are in jujitsu in terms of the kind of jujitsu player you want to be. Like as, as, Examples of my own personal strategy. Uh, I'm I'm not a big guy. I'm not a particularly fast or athletic guy. I my interest in grappling has never really been to like win the stand up war. I'm not going to be a guy who hits power throws or like doubles or anything. I it's just not my thing. Um, most of my strategy to get the guy on the floor involves like leg entanglements and trips and sweeps. So knowing that and knowing that these are things that I'm generally pretty good at, I I really make sure that I I prioritize techniques that play into what I, the kind of jujitsu practitioner I want to be. So an example from personal training, you know, many, many years ago when I kind of came to this realization, I was hitting like a lot of like tripod sweeps and I was having luck with um, like certain variants of De La Hiva. Then I kind of realized that this was my thing. Um, so I, I started looking for other techniques similar to that and I kind of realized, well, like X guard and single leg X guard and instep guard are all kind of part of this family of, of this type of move that I like. And I made an effort on really focusing on those and simultaneously kind of discarding some of the techniques that I know just aren't right for my particular type of game. Doesn't mean they don't work, just means that for me, maybe they're not ideal. And even at a philosophical level, they're not the kind of grappler I really see myself as. Now that said, just because I don't want to power double someone across the floor, that doesn't mean my opponent feels the same way. So I still have to know these techniques or at least how to defend them. But I also know where to focus my efforts. Uh, there's a thing called the, the Pareto principle. Um, also probably more famously called the, the 80 20 rule. Basically what this says is that you're going to get 80% of your gains out of 20% of your efforts. Uh, this is kind of like a, 
a heuristic that in a pattern that you see a lot, right? You see this in terms of like a wealth distribution and in terms of business results. You know, a lot of the times in business, for example, 80% of your revenues come from only 20% of your customers, which is crazy when you think about it, right? So like 80% of your customers are only contributing a fifth of the revenue that you make. So a smart business decision that you can make in that situation is focus less on the guys who aren't giving you any benefit and focus more on the kinds of people who are. And so in jiu-jitsu, you can make similar strategies, right? It's not necessarily about retaining and remembering everything. It's about being very selective on the things that you do want to retain and remember and giving the, and overweighting those in terms of your effort. Yep. And you see that everywhere. You see that in the animal kingdom. You see that in the music industry when we're mm -hmm. talking about the artists that make the majority yeah. of the music. Um you know, directors that, that rise to the top in the Hollywood and, and make the, the, the biggest movies. Although there's a lot of evil forces at work there, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> well, I, I would venture to guess you also probably see this in terms of tournament competitor success, right? I would venture Absolutely. to guess that 20% of the competitors, I haven't looked at this at all, but if someone wants to plot it out, I'm reasonably confident that you'll find that roughly 20% of the competitors win 80% of the matches. Yeah. And you'll, you'll keep seeing the same names reoccurring at the top of the, of the podium and there's, there's a reason why it's because mm -hmm. well I mean there's many reasons why these people are probably the most consistent they're the most talented they're the hardest working mm -hmm. they do the most steroids and they definitely they definitely are just the best they're always in the best position they you know they 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 are the top 20%. Yeah, yeah. So you can apply this at a micro level as well to your own game, right? And I really encourage everyone when they're evaluating a technique, um, think about this, you know, think about how this fits in your game and understand where you're really having your big successes. I'm not saying only focus on those things that give you big success because you don't want to create closed mindedness, right? You don't want to be shying away from learning new things. Uh, you definitely want to still train and explore those things that maybe you're not as good at because that, that's how you become good at things, right? We talked about investing in loss in previous episodes. Yeah, maybe you're not having success with moves, but you've got to be, you've got to be bad at things before you can be good at them. So I'm not saying don't train these things, but I'm saying be very conscious of what work, what you're doing that works and be deliberate in your training. Understand what kind of grappler you are and understanding that can really allow you to kind of build your game deliberately rather than reactively. And that's a good way to learn it faster and to retain knowledge. Cool. So we also talked about the importance of consistency. I mean, consistency in general is one of the most important mental models when it comes to almost learning almost anything. Yeah. Um, if you are not consistent in your training, you're not going to remember things. That's just the way it is. Um, I don't necessarily mean that you need to be on the mat every day, but as we mentioned in earlier episodes, jujitsu needs to at least take up some of your headspace at all times. Like once a day, I think you should do something to improve your game. That doesn't mean you need to train every day, but you should at least spend five minutes like doing spaced repetition, like we talked about earlier, taking notes, or spend five minutes watching a YouTube video, or five minutes talking to your buddies about jujitsu or something, right? Yeah. Like visualize it, visualization. Yeah. Like you, you need to keep jujitsu as a constant resident in your brain because if you're not consistently thinking about it then your subconscious doesn't really have time to ruminate over things and, and improve and you're eventually going to lose those things anyone who's had a long layoff knows what i'm talking about here uh, i had a very long layoff and when i came back it was frustrating because I knew all of the stuff that I, I know now. I didn't really forget stuff, but I couldn't do it anymore. Like if you asked me to sit there and explain to you how to do like a De La Hiva sweep, I could do it, but I couldn't do it fast enough to actually do it in practice because these things had moved out of my muscle memory. So it's, that's all the more important to be consistent. And so even my suggestion is even if you cannot physically train every day, take some time to deliberately at least mentally think about jujitsu so that you keep up some degree of consistency across the board. Yeah. And so like Steve said, so many different ways you can do this, whether it's just mentally visualizing or uh, just studying, reading, reading a jujitsu book, watching fights. Um, sometimes I, I, I learn the most just by watching fights because mm -hmm. you actually see how these high level guys are moving. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to actually be physically moving. Of course, you know, training is probably the best way to, mm -hmm. to get that, 
that repetition and muscle memory down. But just the more that you can just, even if it's a little bit each day and just dedicate yourself a few minutes each day to jujitsu, that's definitely going to add up over time as opposed to just saying, okay, today's my day off. I'm not even going to think about jujitsu. Try to have a mindset where every day you're going to try to at least think about something that you do well and something you could do a little bit better. Yeah. And when it comes to consistency, I mean, a big question is, well, okay, consistency helps you retain knowledge, but how do you stay consistent? Like it's easy to be consistent for a month. How do you do that for 20 years? Um, we're, we're probably going to actually talk quite extensively about staying consistent and, and having longevity in jujitsu. But I think that's a whole episode discussion. However, in, in the context of how it helps you retain knowledge, that there are some pointers that I could suggest. Uh, one is, Having, you know, like an accountability buddy is very helpful. You know, if you've got someone who, who also trains, who has similar goals with you, um, working together to also use this person as a sounding board, you know, to bounce ideas off of kind of like a training partner who's going down the same road as you yeah. can be very motivating because you feel accountable to that person, right? If, if they are expecting you to keep pace with them, then it gets really, really hard to kind of, you know, let them down. You want to help them. You want to be, you want to stay pace with them. So I find, I find it very helpful in that regard. Um, for example, one of the reasons why I think we've had no real issues keeping consistent with this podcast is because Matt and I are accountability buddies on this podcast. I can't not do it because I feel like I'm letting him down, right? So that having an accountability buddy can be very, very helpful. And it's also someone that you can share notes and compare your game with. Yeah. And, and just having someone that push you like, uh, in ter- we've always used leg locks as an example throughout this podcast. But if you're, if you're completely new to leg locks, you don't learn it at your school. And then, you know, you go to a private with someone who's really good with leg locks and then you take it back to your gym. Uh, you're just, just by knowing a little bit of knowledge, you're probably going to be able to leg lock everyone. Mm-hmm. Having someone that you actually are sharing that journey with and learning that system with, um, you're going to be able to basically build each other up push each other bounce ideas off each other and and uh and really build a framework together it's going to be much more productive if you work together rather than you just being the leg lock guy at your gym you have no one that, there that's going to push you it's more important to to make that relationship with obviously Obviously, at your school, you want to be, you know, you want to train with everyone and you don't want to be like necessarily biased towards anyone, but you're going to gravitate towards some people more than others because maybe they push you more or maybe you're good friends with them or whatever. Or maybe they just have a very similar jujitsu journey to you, right? Like maybe they kind of want to be the same type of grappler that you do too and you're at a similar level. This ties into the plus minus equals mental model that we talked about previously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's much like, you know, you would have a spotter at a gym that motivates you, that helps you, picks you up, pushes you harder. That's what you want to have, you know, and you could have several of these people too. Uh, Ideally, you'll have a whole gym full of these people, but especially when you're trying to learn and retain new information, to have someone that will give you that live feedback and tell you, you know, give give you feedback. If, if you're doing a heel hook and on someone and they tap instantly and you don't have to actually work for anything you're, and then you get used to someone tapping constantly, that's not going to be as benefit. It's going to be a bit of a, fa- a false positive as compared to someone who can, you know, start giving you different defenses, start giving you constructive criticisms and feedback in real time. That's going to be the stuff that pushes you ahead and, and uh, makes you more, uh, makes you a more complete grappler. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And, and another thing too, that I find helpful when it comes to improving my ability to recall is actually teaching, um, be, and, and not necessarily even to more junior people, but even just explaining what's in my head. One of the things I've actually found very beneficial about this podcast is it forces me to say out loud some of the things that have been sitting in my brain for a long time. Uh, those of you guys at, at the black belt level probably can relate, but you know, a lot of the time, what really improves your knowledge is not just time on the mat, but it's finding someone junior who wants to learn something and sitting down and and having to explain it to them. The act of explaining something to someone, it it forces you to really think about things in the simplest possible terms. And I find that that can really improve your understanding of things that you even technically already know. I have actually had a lot of my big insights in jujitsu, not because someone told me something, but because I was explaining something to a student or to a junior Mm. person. And while I was doing that, I kind of had a a, a eureka moment about something that I'd been doing, you know, many, many times before in the past, just things would occur to me because by 
by the act of having to explain something, you have to really think it through in the most in-depth, but also most basic level. It's such a, like, that is such an important tool. uh, And that's, I don't know if that's why I started loving teaching. I I, I love teaching cooking before I even got into jujitsu, but I, I, I really wanted to always be a teacher of, of something like culinary arts. And then I started doing jujitsu and I realized like, man, I love teaching jujitsu. And I was noticing at a very uh, early stage that passing on information was great for my own development as well. So, um, for all of you out there that, you know, think that it, uh, you want to start possibly being an instructor in jujitsu, that is a great way to force yourself to remember the knowledge and, obviously test your own knowledge and that's why we always are encouraging for questions and things like that mm-hmm. so uh definitely teaching and 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 uh explaining jujitsu is a very important tool in your development yeah when you guys send questions in for us to answer it actually greatly improves my understanding of these things so that's one of the reasons we keep asking for this kind of feedback and for questions to cover in addition to giving us great material to talk about it also forces us to really think through things and maybe learn things or or approach them in a different way from what we've seen before. And it really does help me improve my ability to recall and understand complex concepts. So let's have some questions. Cool. So there was kind of a big one here that came up today. Um, It's it's kind of very broad. uh, So we left a lot of time to talk about it. I'm not surprised this came up, uh, but we were asked to explain more concepts of wedging in jujitsu. And this, this doesn't surprise me at all, right? When you tell people that jiu-jitsu is mostly a game of like frames and levers and wedges it kind of conceptually makes sense but there are so many examples of what that actually means in practice that i think maybe we can revisit this a bit and talk in a little bit more detail about what we mean when we say wedging so matt do you want to kick this off yeah for sure so when we talk about uh a wedge what a wedge is it's a mechanism right essentially a wedge is actually a frame of some sort that immobilizes a portion of your opponent's body Okay, and that's all a wedge is. It's used to immobilize. So the different things that I can think about using a wedge for, uh, for one example, you could use a wedge to uh, apply finishing mechanics. This could be in terms of a choke. For instance, if I have a rear naked choke, I don't just want to, it's not a squeezing submission, but more, uh, you know, I get my arms in 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 a position into the rear naked choke position, but then I apply a wedge behind my opponent's head, which, Mm -hmm. and and the ability, uh, sorry, the purpose of that is to break their posture and to push their arteries deeper into the choke. Yeah, common common mistake with almost all blood chokes is people failing to create a wedge behind the head to push them down. Because if you don't break, the, first of all, it's going to create more pressure on the choke. But second, if you don't break posture, it is extremely difficult to actually effectively finish a choke because the person has a lot of opportunities to escape. That's right. You don't take away the resources to, uh, to you don't immobilize them, first of all. You, the, the applying a pre, uh, a wedge behind your opponent's head is essentially creating a, a wedge on the lever to their spine, right? Mm-hmm. So if you don't do that, you're going to get a lot of flailing, a lot of movement, and um, it's going to be hard times for sure. And another, another time you could use a wedge in terms of finishing mechanics. We did touch on this on some of the previous episodes, but, you know, an arm bar, right? Having a... Uh, if you don't have, uh, if you're not pinning the end of the lever, in this case, not the not the hand, because we all know we need to pull the, we need to control the wrist. But if you're not pinning the other end of the lever, the shoulder, there's going to be mobility throughout the shoulder when you try and bridge your hips into their elbow. If their shoulder is mobile, then the pressure is going to bleed, and you're not going to be able to apply an actual armbar that's going to break your opponent's arm. So. It's really important to think about immobilization when we're thinking about uh, when we're thinking about finishing joint locks, and when we're thinking about wedges specifically. Yeah. So I, I guess another example, as it pertains to like the arm bar, you want to have a wedge on the near shoulder because you know, as we mentioned in an in an earlier episode, um, joints are flexible and pressure can bleed from one joint to the adjacent joints. So you need a wedge on the near arm because. That's how you actually apply braking pressure. But I I found also you generally also want a wedge on the far shoulder as well. So technically Mm -hmm. you're wedging both shoulders because that's how you restrict their escape options. They, it's very hard to like hitchhiker escape or, or do anything like that if 
both of your shoulders are wedged. Yeah, and, and controlling the free arm is another great example, uh, which is going to put your opponent in that straight jacket position, essentially limiting their movement, immobilizing them. And it's we'll talk more when we do a, a future podcast on leg locks, but controlling the free leg or the free arm is a it's a very effective way to uh, use joint locks when we're talking about arms and legs. Makes sense. Um, an- another way you could use a wedge would be to, uh, let's say if we're trying to pass the guard and securing a guard pass, uh, for example, like a neon belly. You know, a neon belly is used to apply pressure. You look at you, it is what it is. You're putting pressure onto your opponent's solar plexus with your knee. But really what you're doing is you're creating a wedge that's preventing them from uh, moving their hips and creating a, a structure between their elbow and their knee on that side. Um, if you can separate that elbow and knee and then occupy that space with a portion of your body or uh, let's say like a shin, like a neon belly, you're going to be able to uh, prevent them from regarding and, you know, immobilizing their structure in that moment. So securing that position, creating a wedge, which is separating that structure is going to be able to uh, help you maintain an advantageous position. Yeah. An example of something I've been working on recently, uh, like if you're, if you're passing guard, you'll notice that a lot of different guard passes, like particularly the stack pass, a big part of what you're doing is you're putting wedges on your opponent's hips. That's basically what makes it work, right? A, a lot of the, the times where you're going to use wedges most successfully are wedging the hips and the shoulders or the neck, because by doing that, you can kind of immobilize the core. So m- most wedging strategies generally are, are about that, right? Like you want to prevent your, you know that your opponent's core is strong and you can't attack the core directly, like we've talked about earlier. Um, but if you put wedges around the joints that that connect to the core, like you prevent their ability to move their hips, then suddenly their core is not powerful anymore. So a lot of really effective passes um, or positional control elements involve wedging on the hips or wedging on the shoulders for this precise reason. Yeah, an- another great example uh, that you could use a wedge for would be to escape submissions. Mm-hmm. So um, for instance, let's say I'm stuck in an arm bar or, I mean, and it applies a lot for leg locks too, but I'll use armbar because I think it's more common for, for listeners. If you're, let's say, stuck in an armbar, you're in the top position and your, your opponent is trying to attack you in armbar. Obviously, our goal here is to keep our arm from getting fully extended. That is obvious. So trying to yank your arm out a lot of the time can be kind of catastrophic. Uh, trying to, trying to maintain, uh, and regain and maintain your posture is a really important thing. So you don't want your head to be pulled down. It's going to be extremely hard to, to pull out of the arm bar eventually when that happens. But if I can, if I can first prevent my arm from getting fully extended and, uh, not get swept. So I maintain my base. A lot of the time, what I like to do is I like to insert my knee basically into my opponent's butt, which is creating a a counterpoint Mm -hmm. and, slowly I can use this to start extracting my elbow line and once my elbow line's clear as we all know I'm pretty much safe from the arm bar so very important if you're in the arm bar you know posture structure base uh, I don't get swept right that, that's number one if I get swept now I'm basically in that spider web position the arm bar position and things of you know now I'm gonna have to regain my base before I can escape use most of the time and uh, and I can use my knee by creating almost a knee elbow connection and, and pressing my knee down on my opponent's butt to create a to create that pry bar and get my elbow free. Yeah, that, that's actually a, a good point when it comes to submission defense. Wedges are, are actually quite critical in submission defense. So uh, an example that I, I can often think of is, you know, in most submissions, what your opponent is trying to do is they're trying to isolate a single target on your body and apply overwhelming force against it, right? Like an example is the arm bar, right? You're, that, the arm bar only works if your opponent can isolate your arm from the rest of your body. If, if you can't do that, there's no arm bar. So a common defense, if you, if you can catch the submission before it's fully locked on, is you can like use the rest of your body, whether it be your knees, uh, your elbows, or even your head, to wedge your opponent's legs so that your opponent cannot wrap their legs around your arm. So like if I, if I feel that Matt's going to throw up an arm bar, one of my immediate reactions is I want to use my other hand as a wedge to prevent his legs from closing. Because if he cannot close his legs, and then he can't isolate my arm. And if he can't isolate my arm, he can't armbar me. So this this is something that applies to a lot of submissions. Like you can use it as a defense against. I use it as a defense against kimuras, although it's challenging there because you also have to deal with the rotational aspect of a kimura. But in general, 
if your opponent is trying to like wrap their whole body around one of your limbs, you can use your other limbs to create wedges to block that. That's like a good defense against a lot of submissions. Yeah, and if let's say you're in your opponent's closed guard and you manage to pop that guard open, uh, one of my main reactions is to post a knee on the inside, creating almost mm-hmm. uh, a knee elbow connection, and this. This essentially creates a structure to my from my knee and elbow and denies my opponent the ability to shoot their hips up into my armpit, thus isolating my elbow my my arm from the elbow up, and this will prevent pretty much any arm bar attack as long as I can keep the structure. So you know, lots of uses for wedges. Uh, it's a topic that you know if you're not thinking about mechanisms that we've talked about in previous episodes, such as wedges, levers, frames, hooks, clamps. These these are all everywhere in jujitsu, and really, once you start isolating these uh, concepts and talking about them and using this language with your team, it's gonna be it's gonna be so much easier to move forward and dissect techniques and why they work and what doesn't work and what's effective. So really, I, I, I recommend you guys check out our previous episodes on mechanisms and also uh, check out Rob Bernacki's uh, BJJ Core Concepts app. Yeah, and this actually ties back to what we talked about with first principles. Like I, I would suggest if there's a move that you're working on or that you really want to understand better think of that move and think of how it works and then break that down into first principles so ask yourself who has the alignment in this situation Uh, and if it's if you don't how do you get it if your opponent does how do you take it away ask yourself where are the levers in the situation who who have you know where are the frames where are the wedges could you apply these in in, in different ways to further break your opponent's alignment or improve your own. Um, this is like a, a five minute thought exercise going through in any individual technique will probably increase your understanding of that technique a lot and might have even give you some ideas to improve its effectiveness for you. Yeah. And really the exercise, what it does is it, it really just gives you an overall assessment of who is in a good position. Mm-hmm. Um, we always want to stay in good position. That is kind of the key here. I When, when I first started learning jujitsu, I would think like, I want to do my favorite move. I like the arm bar, so I want to get to the arm bar. Yeah, tunnel and, vision, right? Yeah, like, tunnel vision. Where, how do I get to yeah. the arm bar? That's all I care about. It's like it's like a horse with blinders on. Yeah, and what, once we use these alignment concepts, it becomes more about how do I maintain good position and uh, deny my opponent from having good position. Yeah. So again, check out the alignment th- uh, and the me- mechanisms episodes that we had previous. Well, hope this was helpful to everybody. It definitely was helpful to me to kind of get some of these ideas set out loud. This is something that anyone who's been training for a while kind of struggles with. You know, how do you make sense of all of this information that's been thrown at you? Uh, We shared some techniques as to how we do it. Hopefully this is helpful. If you have anything that you use, which helps you retain uh, knowledge over the long term, please do share. I'd love to hear about that. We can also add that content to the website or even discuss these ideas in a future episode if it merits. That would be really awesome if you guys have any extra ideas that you would love to... uh that you that that you use to help you retain and, and absorb new information we'd love to talk about it consider it and you know if it's really great we'd love to add it to, to the website if it's something that you you know you would be okay with so i hope you guys enjoyed the chat that we had and keep the questions coming thank you for your support thank you